No, 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 thank you. What is it? I don't know. All right, we'll get started. My students are not here, but then we'll get started for those of us who are online. Um, so let's look at this explanation that is given uh, for this statement. God is one in three persons and how this particular statement does not have any contradiction in it. Okay, so um, the explanation that is given is that God is one in a certain way. Okay, in a certain way, God is one, but in a different way, he is three persons. So we're not saying that God is one and God is three in the same way. In one way, he is, God is one, but in a different way, he is three persons. So there is no actual contradiction. Let's look at an example. That's Sproul, you know. Uh, Sproul was this uh, very uh, godly, reputed preacher from some previous century. And this is the uh, example that he tried to use. He took the, um, you know, fictional work of a um, writer named Charles Dickens. The book that he was referring to was the, you know, famous book, A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, okay, so the tale of two cities begins with these opening words. This is the first sentence of the book. When you open the book, this is the very first sentence that you read. It says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And then you would have, you know, you would probably say to Charles Dickens, you know, make up your mind. You're talking about one time period. Okay, he's basically talking about the late 18th century. That's basically the when you know we had the French Revolution taking place. So he's basically talking about that time period. And he's saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. So which is it? It can't be both. So you make up your mind. Is it the best or is it the worst? Is what you would say to him. But you know, in his next sentence, he goes on to explain what is he trying to say. He says. It was the age of wisdom, but it was the age of foolishness. So you see, it was the age of wisdom in one way. In a certain way, it was the age of wisdom because during that time, there were good people who did good things. There were wise people who took wise decisions. There were many um, wise and good things which took place. So in a certain way, it was definitely the best of times. But in another way, in a different way, it was also the worst of times because there were fools who were doing evil things. They were indulging in dark deeds and they were spreading evil and wickedness. So in another way, it was also the worst of times. So we're not saying it was the same, it was the best and the worst in the same way. In one way, it was the best, but in another way, it was the worst. And so Sproul tried to explain to his audience and say to them, in one way, God is one in his being, in his being, in his substance, in his essence, in his divinity. There's only one divinity. In his, in his divinity, he's only one divinity. There are, not, there are not three different types of divinities. So in one way, in a certain way, he is one. But in another way, in his personhood, he is three. So in his essence, in his being, in his substance, in his divinity, he is one. But in his personhood, he is three, was the explanation which Prowl, you know, tried to give. Now, if you can kind of wrap your head around that, fine. If you cannot, that is also fine. Um, um, let's just move on from there. Um, you know, go, to go back to the, you know, example that we used earlier. If I had three students standing over here in front of me, I would do a head count and I would say, oh, human being number one, person number one, human being number two, person two, human being number three, person three. And then, you know, the three students walk off, God comes and stands over there and I would look at him and say, oh, divine being number one. And there's no number two or number three, just one divine being, divine being one. But in that divine being, there are three persons. That's a little beyond my understanding. But you see, if you're doing a head count, there is only divine being number one. That's it. There are no others. Like he says in Isaiah 46, 
I am the Lord and there is no other one divine being. In that divine being, there are three, which is a little beyond our understanding at the moment. Okay, so um, we have to, uh, you know, that is why it's very, very wrong to say that sometimes God becomes the father and sometimes he becomes the son. Completely wrong doctrine. Okay, so um, the father always stays as the, as the father. One day he doesn't, you know, say, okay, fine, I think today I'll, be, I'll become the son. And the third day he doesn't say, oh, I think today it's my turn to be the Holy Spirit. No, the father will is has always from eternity been the father and he will continue being the father. So there are three distinct persons. The father always remains the father. The Holy Spirit always is the Holy Spirit. That is his very uh, identity. That's, that, that is who he is in his essence, in his nature, in, in, in his Godhead. And uh, the father who is equally the same essence and the same nature of God, Godhead, he is always the father. Okay, so in their personhood, they remain what they are as three separate, distinct persons. Um, they are not three different ways of looking at the same God. They are three different, distinct persons. Um, so this one, uh, you know, um, criticism which used to be raised earlier, and then so people would say, oh, when Jesus Christ was on the earth, if he was God, every time he would pray, he was praying to himself. Because he's God, right? So we don't accept that kind of an argument, simply because we have now understood the fact that this one being has three persons. So we know that when Jesus was here on the earth and he was praying, he was not praying to himself. He was praying to the other person of the Godhead. He was praying to the Father. So we don't, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, go with uh, silly arguments, uh, you know, like that. So uh, just to look maybe a little more uh, at the personhood of the Holy Spirit, because people are very, very clear about um, God the Father as one distinct person. And they have a very clear picture of Jesus Christ as being one distinct person. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, um, I have been in churches where some of the believers would actually call him an it. They would just think of him as this wind or this power or this force which is rushing into the room and it's going to make them, you know, um, uh, um, you know, manifest in different ways. And so they would say, oh, when it comes, it will, it, you know, it, it will change us. It's not an it who is coming into the room. It's a him. He, he is a person. He's not just some kind of a power or a force that is coming into the room. You know, he is part of the Godhead. And... Um, uh, that is how he is you know, addressed in the scriptures as a person. And so if you look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, it's, it says over there, today if you hear his voice, it's not just some impersonal force. He is a person and he has a voice and he speaks. So in Hebrews 3, 7, you know, today if you hear his voice uh, you know, saying, and then it goes on to give the rest of the verse. Um, he is somebody who thinks, who, you know, he's, he's a thinking being, he's a rational being, he's able to reason out and think. Uh, uh, a scripture for that would be Acts chapter 15, verse 28, where it says, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. So the leaders the spiritual leaders in uh, you know in acts chapter 15 they sat down and they thought and they reasoned among themselves and they decided you know we should not burden the gentile believers with the mosaic traditions so they reasoned and they thought out and they came to a conclusion and the holy spirit was along with them in this process the holy spirit also thought and reasoned and you know decided yes this would be a good thing so it's not the Holy Spirit is not just some kind of a wind or a force. He is a person and he thinks, he reasons, he speaks. Another thing which brings out his personhood, he has a will of his own. He decides for himself, uh, you know, uh, things. The same way we have a willpower, he too, you know, is a, is a person. He has a will. Uh, 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 an example that we can use from the scriptures would be 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 11. If someone could read out 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11.
as he wills so the gifts are distributed by the holy spirit and he thinks oh what shall i give this particular person you know and so according to his will according to what he has decided and determined he gives so he is a person who has a will and he has feelings which verse do you think brings out that even if you don't know the reference can you just think of the verse which which expresses the fact that the holy spirit has feelings ah you know so yeah like she said you know don't do not grieve the holy spirit ephesians 4:30 and do not grieve the holy spirit which means he can be grieved he feels feelings okay so and he is definitely a person because he is able to have a relationship with others okay so um that would be second corinthians 13 14 you know which we just the benediction so it we have the grace of the lord jesus christ being talked about the love of god and then it goes on to say the fellowship of the holy spirit so he's able to relate with us on a daily basis he is able to fellowship with us in a on a daily basis and um, you know um, which is why uh, i think it is john piper or someone who talks about this triune god he says he is one being and he unfolds into three interpersonal relationships so he is one being but in this one being there are three interpersonal relationships the father relating with the son and the son you know having a relationship with the father and the holy spirit and the holy spirit communicating with both of them so in that one being there is a lot of interpersonal uh, relationship interactions going on and so they are relating to each other in their personhood so in one way in their being they are one but in another way in their personhood they are three and they are relating with each other okay so uh, the holy spirit is a person who can relate uh, with the with the other uh, with the other persons of the godhead and also with us humans um okay uh, now people who could not understand uh, the concept of trinity they came up with some wrong doctrines so uh, you know a, a wrong doctrine is technically called a heresy so there were a lot of heresies which began to develop in the early centuries and so um yeah maybe we can just look at those heresies first uh, one of the uh, you know wrong doctrines which came up uh, was called modalism m o d a l i s m okay so you now modalism basically was teaching that um there is only one god so sometimes he'll appear as father sometimes he'll make an appearance as a son and sometimes he'll make an appearance as a as the holy spirit so um while you know while while doing creation in genesis he became god the father and then uh, when he was living here on the earth he became the son and so now he is there in us in the form of the holy spirit but it's all just one single god is what they say and they fail to accept the fact that uh he is one in three persons they deny the three persons part of it they deny his personhood uh so today we have um, a cult which follows this uh you know teaching and they are called the oneness pentecostals so the oneness pentecostals they don't believe in him being three persons they just say that he is one okay so um but when we look at matthew chapter 3 verse 16 to 17 which talks about the baptism of the holy spirit over there you have three clear persons being mentioned so i'm assuming that when the oneness pentecostals gather together and they read their bibles they make sure that they skip this particular passage because they would not be able to explain it because over here in matthew 3 16 to 17 you have all the three of them being present as three separate distinct persons maybe we could actually read it out Matthew chapter 3 verses 16 to 17 Hmm Okay so here um 
I mean, modelism just doesn't work over here because over here you have Jesus coming up out of the water. As he's coming up out of the water, the spirit of God descends upon him like a dove. And then there's a voice from heaven which says, this is my son. So you have the father speaking over there from heaven. You have the spirit of God descending and you have Jesus coming up out of the water. So how can you say that he has appeared? He only appears as one person at a time. Here he is in all the three persons. All three are very clearly there in this particular event. Okay, so modalism and this, uh, you know, the current oneness Pentecostalism, which is going on, is uh, not biblical in any way. Um, then, of course, uh, the other wrong teaching which came up in those days was tritheism. Where basically they're saying, okay, there are three separate gods. We don't have one god, we have three gods, making them into separate beings. Uh, so, which is again not true. And uh, yeah, today you have Mormons who believe in that. They think of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three separate gods. Okay, so that would be our, uh, the, in those days it was called tritheism. Now it's called, you know, Mormons follow that. There's also something else, Arianism. Now, Arianism was a very serious, uh, you know, heresy that began to come into the church at that time, where people began to spread this teaching that Jesus Christ was the first creation of God. Later on, God created the world. Later on, God created humans. But the first thing which God created was he created Jesus Christ, is what they began to teach. And that was a very, very serious, um, you know, uh, dangerous doctrine. Because once you take away the divinity of Jesus Christ, everything he did on the cross would be a complete waste. Because if he is not fully God, uh, then he cannot represent God on our behalf. You know, and if he's only human, then it would mean that he would uh, be born. He would be. He would have been born with the same uh, sinful nature that we have been born with. It just. It would just destroy the entire uh, doctrinal basis, which is you know laid out in the scriptures. So Arianism was a very very serious, uh, serious heresy that was coming in, and so uh, the spiritual leaders of that time they decided to organize a council. And you know, establish what the correct doctrine is. So the Council of Nicaea, N-I-C-E-A. Okay, the Council of Nicaea that took place in 325 AD. Uh, a whole bunch of spiritual leaders gathered together. They had uh, you know uh, long discussions, and then they clearly wrote down. See, this is what the Bible is saying about different things. So they wrote out a lot of important doctrines i think that was the first time they maybe they that they actually did systematic theology they took all the verses regarding all the important doctrines and they began to put it all together clearly so that future generations will not get carried away by all kinds of wrong uh, you know uh, teachings so they took the effort uh, to really lay down in clear way what the scriptures are saying about all the very very important you know uh, doctrines of our faith so one of the things which they developed was something called the Nicene Creed. Now, if you are from one of the mainline denominations, you know you would be reading it out. I mean, especially the in the Methodist churches, you know. So we would all stand up. You know, we would open the you know our um, the book which is there, and then you would read out the Nicene Creed. You know, saying that this is what I believe. You know, so I believe in one God, the Father, and all of that. So you would so you would read out the Nicene Creed. So um, now the Nicene Creed was, you know, slightly modified again in 381 AD uh, during the Council of the First Council of Constantinople. But yeah, that is what everyone accepts that today. You know, at the Protestants, the Catholics, uh, the Orthodox, uh, you know, Christians, they all accept that the Nicene Creed is accurate in what it is saying about the Godhead, what it is saying about His being what it is saying about his personhood okay so that is a good uh, creed to look at you know when you are trying to understand the doctrine of god and the doctrine of trinity um yeah so um we say that um god is one being one single substance and that he is eternal and uncreated nobody created him so God the Son was not created. He always was there. Just like it says in John 1.1. 1, 1. He was always with God and he was God. 
Okay, so the Nicene Creed brings out the fact that he is one single substance, one single being, and he was eternal and uncreated. Uh, it also talks about how uh, they are equal. Um, and it's only for the purpose of, um, um, yeah, it's only for the purpose of redemption that they adopted. Okay, shall we look at this later? Okay, you know, just to, just to you know, bring up, bring one sentence in regarding that. So when Jesus came to the earth to redeem mankind, at that time he chose to place himself under God the Father. You know, so he was submissive to God the Father. Uh, but it did not make him inferior in any way. He was uh, representing us humans. So in the same way we obey God the Father and we submit to him, he as our perfect representative, he also chooses to obey the Father and learn obedience through suffering, it says in the scriptures. So he too submitted. And uh, so in that sense, in his humanity, God the Father submits to God, God the Son, sorry, so sorry, God the Son submits to God the Father. But uh, if you look at uh, them in their eternal existence, they have always been equal. Okay, so um, yeah, that's just one point that we need to you know, bring out. Um, so there are all kinds of analogies which are used to describe this trinity but the word analogy it just basically means uh, comparisons we try to use comparisons we compare two different things to try and explain something to, to try and make it more clear but we need to understand that all comparisons are weak there is no comparison avail available which can clearly explain the trinity so all the comparisons that we have today are limited and so you can use those comparisons when you're trying to explain trinity to somebody but if you stretch the comparison too much you'll end up with the wrong doctrine so you should just take the example the comparison in a light way to an extent but never ever stretch out a comparison because then you'll end up with a wrong doctrine the egg is what is generally used, right? As, a, as, a, as an example. So they talk about the the you know the the white uh, the, the shell of of course of the egg, and then they talk about the white portion of the egg, and then you have the yellow yolk. And so they say, see, Trinity is like this. The problem with that example would be there are three different substances. The shell is a different substance. The white uh, you know, portion is a different substance and the yolk is again a separate substance. But here we are talking about an entity, a divine entity, a divine being who is just one single essence, one single substance. So it's a weak example. It's not really a correct example. So if you stretch it too far, you, you would end up with a uh, wrong theology. You would, you would in fact end up with the heresy of uh, tritheism. So they're not three separate. The way the egg is three separate things, the uh, the uh, trinity is uh, uh, the triune god is not three separate uh, you know beings the example of water which is again used to explain the trinity uh, they talk about you know how water is uh, one single substance okay water is one single substance but you see it in three different forms so you have the liquid water and then you you have the you know the, the uh, water as a uh, as vapor so the problem with this is that um, water at the same moment cannot be liquid and vapor. I, I, when it is sitting on the stove, it is liquid. But then when it starts evaporating, you have one portion of it being vapor. And then you have another portion of it still sitting over there in as liquid. At the same time, this vapor cannot be liquid and water. At the, uh, the vapor cannot be gas and liquid at the same time wow i'm really using my english today <laughs> so yeah okay um another example that yeah people use for uh, you know to try to try and explain the trinity uh, it's, it's very similar to your water vapor uh, kind of uh, example they talk about a person who is a father and that man is also the son of somebody and that person is also the friend of somebody 
so he has three different roles he has the role of a father he has the role of a son and he has the role of a friend but again just like we you know we saw in the water water liquid water and vapor water example um you cannot be all those three things in the same moment so if that man is you know uh, at home playing with his child he is assuming the role of a father in that very same moment he cannot be at his friend's house helping his friend with the repairs over there in the role of a friend he can only be father at one point of time he can only be friend at one point of time but when you look at the single entity the godhead the godhead operates as father son and holy spirit uh, at the same moment for a whole bunch of different people so that is uh, I, so this is not really a very strong example uh, you know um, when they're trying to use the roles that which different people play uh, so that doesn't really help now you know in our modern times people have tried to come up with another new analogy to try and explain the trinity again this is also limited they talk about how light you know the light you know which is coming through the windows and all of that the light the light is one single substance but light is functioning in one particular way and at the same time it is also functioning as a different in a different way so they talk about one single photon of light if you take that one single photon of light it is functioning as a wave and it is also functioning as a my physics have no clue it's also functioning as a particle okay fine so a single photon of light functions as a particle at the same time it is also functioning as a wave it, it depends on how you are looking at that you know um, uh, that particular photon so they say that that is one way of trying to explain the trinity so if you are a quantum physicist uh, go ahead with that you know example it i my physics was rather weak always so let's you know get on with it let's move on to other things so um let's uh, maybe just look at the different roles that the three persons of the trinity played um in creation and also in redemption so the father usually when we look at the scriptures just based on the scriptures which which are there in the bible we kind of get the sense that the father assumes the role of always being the planner the one with the four knowledge the one who decides you know let's you know do it in this particular way okay we're all just um, saying all this at a very very human level because i'm pretty sure that even you know Yeah, the other three uh, the other, yeah, other two persons of the godhead are also involved in the planning but generally this is basically how people say it you know they say that uh, the father is the one who creates the plan he makes the plan and then uh, the son he you know he implements the plan and actually brings it into existence because god the father thinks it out and god the son enacts it and makes it happen and then once it's enacted and in, and in place then the holy spirit runs it you know he kind of runs it on a day to day basis um i think there's a very very severe compartmentalization and i don't think they they actually function that way so god is probably like you know nodding his head and thinking ah oh, no this is one messed up example so you know let's not take it too literally but in the redemption plan we see that okay so they take this whole redemption plan which god worked out for humanity and they try to apply it to him in 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 the creative act and in his judgment and everything i think that would be stretching it a little bit but yes in the redemption plan we very very clearly see that god the father decided that he would save mankind in this particular way so he he is the one who decides that um, um at the set time you know he's going to send forth his son so uh, galatians 4 4 to 5 um if someone could read out galatians 4 4 to 5 Ah uh, yes, I was a little distracted. Which verse are we looking? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, Galatians four, four to five. Um, 
so when the set time had fully come at that time god sends the sun so uh, you know uh, they say that god is the one who was kind of setting the time he arranged for events to take place in a particular way you know he um, he caused a law, whole bunch of actions to happen and so all of those things led up to that moment when the correct opportune time came along and then uh, you know at that at that moment the he sent the sun so they talk about how um, uh, you know back in those days when when the when, when that huge famine you know it came upon that entire mediterranean region uh, the the family of uh, abraham the descendants of abraham probably would have died but then god arranged events in such a way that joseph went over there to egypt he became the you know chief administrator over there and then he was able to bring his whole family and over there and he was able to save them so the lineage of abraham continued because god arranged the events and because the lineage continued the messiah was able to come out through the lineage then later on um, at the time of the exile god made a pagan king support the jews give them back the gold and silver and say go back to your homeland build your rebuild your temple so god arranged for that to happen uh, then um, when herod was getting ready to you know uh, uh, to kill all the children in bethlehem if jesus had remained over there he would have been killed so at that time god arranged for an angel to come and warn joseph about it so jo jo joseph is able to escape along with the uh, with his wife and the child so god arranged all of these events and so in the set time jesus christ came and fulfilled the purpose for which he had been called and uh, jesus christ always made this very very clear that he had come over here to the earth to carry out the redemption plan just one uh, bible passage maybe we can look at john chapter 6 verses 37 and 38 john 6 37 and 38 Um, I don't know which is which one. It is thirty-seven or thirty-eight. No, about doing the Father's will. Or did I get my passage entirely wrong? If you could read out that, please. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so he was Jesus was very very clear about this right from the time he came. he started his ministry he says i have come not to do my will but the will of him who sent me okay so um god's god the father his role in the redemption plan is that he would arrange events he would cause a series of actions to take place so that the set time will come once that set time comes uh, jesus christ will be sent once jesus christ is sent and he's old enough to understand who he is from that time onwards the son begins to do exactly what the father wants him to do and begins to carry out the plan and the holy spirit he after jesus christ finished his work on the cross now the holy spirit um, he begins to implement this redemption plan in our lives in two ways there are two roles which the holy spirit plays in the redemption plan of god the first is that he helps people to come to god in the first place okay so uh, how does he do that john chapter 16 verse 8 if someone could read out john 16 verse 8 and when he has come he will convict and he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment yes so um god the father has done his part god the son also on the cross he was going to be doing his part and then jesus says that you know once i am finished with my work the holy spirit will come he says when he has come he will convict the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment so the holy spirit is actively at work today helping people to understand that they are sinners that they need a savior and that salvation can only come through one single person jesus christ so the holy spirit is actively at work today implementing the plan which you know jesus christ enacted 
on the cross. So that is one aspect of what the Holy Spirit is doing. The other, of course, is the work which he does in believers after they become believers. He transforms them. He works in them. Um, maybe we can look at Ezekiel chapter 36 from the Old Testament. Ezekiel 36, verse 27. Yeah, 36, yeah, Ezekiel 36. Yeah. Ouch. So maybe I wrote down the wrong passage. Ezekiel 36, 27. Oh, okay, my English. 36, 27. I didn't pronounce properly. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so this had not yet happened at that time. In fact, even the second part of the redemption plan had not yet happened. Uh, but he, you know, here God talks about the future and he says, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. So once the Holy Spirit, you know, is, uh, the Holy Spirit is right now out in the world, convicting people, helping them to reach out to God. And once they have made that commitment, once they have accepted him as Lord, then he begins to work inside them to move them to follow his scriptures. It's a beautiful thing. You and I would just be sitting as you know uh, saved uh, sinners, uh, not even bothering to sanctify ourselves, not even bothering to grow if Holy Spirit was not there. He is constantly moving us inside, urging us to reach out to the Lord, to become more like Christ. He is doing that active work inside us. So. In this sense, all three of them have specific roles in the redemption plan. Uh, we see that. But then we, it's wrong to say that it's always the father who initiates the plan, you know, like as if he's the only one who can think. It's not true because God the Son involved in the planning phase. Uh, but in the redemption plan, the father, in his foreknowledge, decides these are the things that will be done. And Jesus Christ enacts it, implements it on the cross. And the Holy Spirit administers the plan, runs it on a daily basis so that it will all come to pass in his perfect time. We'll just look at one last thought. Um, and then, you know, you can go and relax. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, if we can have one person read out. Ephesians 2, verse 18. Yeah, so it, here it's talking about how we human beings have access to the Father by one Spirit. And so, um, you know, uh, they say when we are praying, we should pray to the Father because, you know, you're, you're trying to gain access to the uh, throne of God. So they say you, have, you should pray to the Father and then you would do it, of course, in the name of Jesus. What does it mean by that? It's basically saying, in the name of all that he did for us on the cross, because of what he did on the cross, we can actually go to the Father. So in the name of Jesus, like, the name of Jesus is like a, what, uh, you know, it's the, it's, the pass, uh, it's the pass key. You know, you show that, and that, that gives you the permission to enter inside. So you show that, you know, that pass key, which says, you know, this is what Jesus Christ did for me. So once you show that, oh, okay, if Jesus did that for you, yes, you can go inside. So you're able to enter. Because in his name, through him, you're able to enter. And uh, who is the one who's leading you into that place? It's the Holy Spirit. So again, it's uh, um, not to be, I mean, you don't have to accept it you know, uh, in that particular way. But it's just one way of trying to express how prayer gets done. So when you go before the throne of God, obviously you're going uh, to the uh, triune Godhead. It's not like as if you're going and standing in front of the throne only in front of God the Father. So yes, it is true that you're going into God's presence, into the presence of the triune God. But it is true that you are going in the name of Jesus. That's very, very clear. Because there's no way you could have even accessed that throne room without his, uh, without, without his finished work. It's only by his blood 
through his righteousness that you're entering inside. So we do go to prayer, go to the Lord in prayer in the name of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit helps us in, in praying. He's the one who leads us. So that is also very true. But the first part about how you're praying only to the Father, um, yes, it is true that because Jesus does use that verse where he says, you know, you can ask the Father what you will and he will grant it. But I would like to think that when you go and stand in front of the throne, you are standing in front of the entire Godhead uh, because that is basically how it is, right? So yes, these are all different ways that people are trying to express the Trinity at the practical application level. Okay, so um, yes, I have nothing more to say. If anyone has any doubts, you can ask. Uh, please don't ask me something very, very metaphysical and high. I will not even know how to handle it. But yeah, if, if you have any doubts, you can ask. Otherwise, we, you know, we can conclude with a word of prayer. Um, here, we just had Jackin's you know, um, question about the ice and the liquid and the vapor. Oh, yeah, that's so true, right? I mean, I forgot the ice part when I was talking about it. But yeah, like we said, uh, the ice cannot be ice and liquid and vapor at the same time. It can only be one thing at one point of time. So that would, yeah, again, be a weak example. Um, so yes, let's just conclude with a word of prayer then. Thank you so much, O Lord, that um, even though we may not understand all of you in our finite little minds, we can still come to you and we can still enjoy all of your omnipotence, all of your omniscience, and Lord, all of your, uh, um, the other part of you which I cannot remember. Lord, I'm so sorry. Lord, it's just beautiful that we being finite beings who cannot even understand you, even though we don't have that comprehension, we can still come to you and have all of your infiniteness at our disposal. It's so amazing that you should love us that much to give all of your infiniteness to finite beings who can't even understand your nature fully. You're such a loving, gracious, generous, abundant, uh, ab uh, bountiful God, O oh Lord, in the way you provide for us. Thank you so much, O oh Lord, for that. We pray that we would live lives that truly honor you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And we'll meet again next class.